Jesus didn't end the sacrificial system so that we could just live well manicured, safe, and self-centered lives. He didn't do it for us to go about our days without relying on the leading and guiding and power of the Holy Spirit. No, he entered Jerusalem that week so that he can lay down his life and rise again so that he could build something better and build something truly beautiful in you. That is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is so much better than anything this world has to offer. He is the cornerstone. So build your life, your dreams, your ambitions, your family, your career, your finances, your time. Build it all on that cornerstone because I promise you, Jesus is better. Don't settle for anything less than what He offers. Welcome to Dreamers and Disciples. I'm really glad that you're here today. And I'm excited to share a message that I preached recently at Generation Church in Portland, Tennessee. Generation is a fantastic church just north of Nashville. They're led by Pastor Brandon Petty, who's a good friend. He's also been a previous guest on this podcast. And they were in a series on the book of Mark. So I got to come in and preach from Mark chapter 11, verses 11 through 21. In fact, when the message starts in just a moment, we're gonna join after I've already read that scripture. So I wanted to make sure you knew the context. But this is when uh, Jesus enters Jerusalem for Holy Week and he confronts the religious leaders and the money changers about how they had taken this beautiful gift of the temple that was meant to be a shadow pointing to the ultimate reality of Jesus. And they were settling for that shadow because it had begun to serve them. They had taken this beautiful sacrificial system and made it about how it benefited them rather than how it served and honored God. And while it's easy for us to point fingers at them and wonder how they could have done that when the Messiah was entering in and they were seeing the ultimate reality right in front of them, how did they not repent? How did they not lay down all of that and worship Jesus? But we do this all the time. We take a gift from God and we turn it into something that we serve rather than using it to serve the giver of that gift. And in fact, I talk about that a lot in my book that's been out for about six months now. This dream is not for you. And so I mentioned that in the message, but if this message resonates with you, I think the book will actually help you even more. So make sure to check that out if you haven't read it. But I just pray that this message will really help you uh, trust that Jesus is so much better than any good gift that this world has to offer. Jesus is the cornerstone that we are meant to build our lives upon. So now let's join this message. Don't settle for the shadow already in progress. All right, so I mentioned that my twin daughters are 15, that I'm teaching them to drive right now. But this year was not their first year or their first time behind the wheel of a motorized vehicle. It actually happened about 11 years ago on their fourth birthday. So I want y'all to just Check this to help me set up the message today. Whoa! That's awesome. It's wet. It's not wet. Get in. So shoes are wet. When you press the pedal, it should All right. go. Hold on. That's oh, backwards. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> All right, now hit it. Go, Liana! You know, there's a lot going on in that video. There's the aggressive camera work from my wife. It's kind of all over the place. There's somebody in the first service said, hey, you made fun of your kids, but you didn't talk about your hair in that video. I was like, I hoped, <laughs> I was hoping nobody would notice that. Um, and then Liana had a very heavy, heavy foot on the accelerator there, which is, might still be the case. But I love that video. I mean, when I was going back and trying to find it, I went on this whole like spiral because parents, doesn't it go quick? Like any parents in here? So yeah, I get a little sad thinking about that. But now look at them 11 years after that. So now they are in the real thing. They are real drivers, which once again is a very scary thing for me and my wife. But here's the point of why I share that to y'all. That Jeep, the Barbie Jeep, on their fourth birthday, that was a really good thing. I thought it was a good gift, but it wasn't the real thing. 
It was just a shadow of what a real Jeep was actually like. It was a pink shadow, but it's a shadow nonetheless. And it was a shadow pointing to something that they would experience later in its fullest extent. But I want you to imagine if my twins decided to settle for the shadow. If they were still at the age of 15, they were driving around the streets of Charlotte, North Carolina in that little Barbie Jeep. Wouldn't really work out to a, or we, you know, we wanted to make a good road trip, a little fun experience from Charlotte to Portland. If we had tried to do that thing in the Barbie Jeep, we would have barely made it out of Charlotte by now. So it had a very specific purpose as a gift and a very specific location, my backyard on Hearst Drive in Charlotte, but it wasn't meant for the real thing. It wasn't meant for the real road. It was a shadow. And I know that sounds like a silly illustration, but how often have you and I settled for a shadow? How often have we settled for something that wasn't the real thing and we settled too soon? So if you're married right now, please do not make eye contact with your spouse because that is not what I'm trying to to do here today. I'm not trying to cause any marital strife or get Pastor Brandon to have to do a a marriage series. Now, if you're dating somebody, you do need to wonder, am I settling right now? But that's a whole other thing. But for this message, more importantly, how often do we settle for far less than what Jesus came to Jerusalem in Mark chapter 11 to accomplish? That's what we're gonna tackle together today because in this passage, we find Jesus condemning the religious leaders who represented the people of Israel because they were settling for a system that served them, but no longer served God. It was a system that was meant to point to something and someone greater. And it now was a symbol of how far they were from the heart of God. And so they were settling for a shadow and the focal point of it all was the temple. So to understand this passage that we read and to understand everything else that we're gonna study together today, we have to understand the temple and what its purpose was from God for the people of Israel. So that brings us to our very first point. Like I said, this is the foundation for everything we're gonna talk about. Jesus is the clear image. The temple was meant to be a mere shadow. Jesus is the clear image. The temple was meant to be a mere shadow. So Jesus enters Jerusalem and his sights are set on the temple. He goes to the temple courts. He has scouted it out and he, you know, he turns over the tables. And then over the next three chapters, chapter Mark 11, 12, and 13, he is confronting the religious leaders and he's confronting what the temple had become. So let me just give you a little background, a high level view of the temple. The temple was the representative place, dwelling place of God among the people of Israel. It was the focal point of their worship. Uh, The temple's innermost room, the Holy of Holies, was where the Ark of the Covenant used to be. Uh, It was various kinds of sacrifices were performed at the temple on a yearly and some of them on a daily basis to remove impurities, atone for sins, make peace with God, to give thanks And this was actually the second temple. The first one had been built by King Solomon centuries and centuries before, but it was destroyed when the Israelites went into captivity. And then when they came back from Babylon, they rebuilt the temple. And then decades before Jesus came on the scene, King Herod, he renovated the temple. And it was said at that time to be the most beautiful building in the world. So that is the temple that Jesus is confronting right now. But regardless of which version of the temple this was, the first or the second, its purpose was still the same. And that was to turn people's hearts to Yahweh, for them to worship Yahweh, for them to surrender to him and to to realize that God was dwelling amidst his people. It was a good gift, but it was always meant to be a temporary gift. It was never meant to last because the purpose of the temple was not the ultimate promise of God for his people. And so that's why I read that verse at the beginning of the message, Hebrews chapter 10, verse one. Let me read it one more time. It says this, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Get this, this is so important. The temple was not able to make anyone permanently right with God. It could never offer complete and lasting forgiveness year after year after year. They had to keep coming back because the temple was a shadow pointing to an ultimate reality and that reality is Jesus. The temple was a picture. It was a signpost. It was a shadow because Jesus could accomplish forever what the temple never could. 
See Hebrews chapter 10, just a few verses later, verse 10 says this, the writer says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. See what Jesus was setting out to do as he entered Jerusalem was the ultimate upgrade, not just for the Jewish people, but for everyone who would call on his name for salvation. But because of the cross, because of the resurrection now, We don't have to go to a temple every year and offer sacrifices. Jesus was the once and for all, final, perfect, eternal sacrifice by which we are forgiven. He is better than the temple. The temple represented the old covenant of the law. Jesus brought the new covenant of grace. The law was powerless to transform our hearts. Jesus gives us a new heart and puts his spirit within us. The temple was the shadow. Jesus is the clear image of who God is is in every single way, Jesus is better. And because he is greater than the temple, he is the only one with authority to judge the temple. And that's why he could come in and do what he did and say what he said. And it's really easy for us to sit here, you know, 2000 years later and think, why didn't the religious leaders understand that? Of course, Jesus is better. But I really want us to take to heart what Jesus does next because it wasn't just a condemnation or a judgment of the religious leaders. I believe it's a word of caution for all of us as well. It's not just about what Jesus did. It's about what he's still doing today. And that brings me to the second point. Jesus will confront your idols, even those that bear God's name. Jesus will confront your idols, even those that bear God's name. So the temple was a beautiful gift from God. It was a shadow, yes, but it was a beautiful shadow because it pointed to an even more beautiful reality. So here's the question that we have to wrestle with. How did something so beautiful become so broken? How does something so beautiful become so broken? And I believe it happens the way it always does in our lives when we stray from the heart of God. It happens little by little by little, and it's barely noticeable in the moment. So just to to make that point, I want to tell y'all a somewhat embarrassing story about myself. First of all, who in here is really bad at directions? Anybody willing to fess up to that? All right. We have some directionally impaired people in here. I promise you I am worse, and I'll prove it to you right now. So about two years ago, this was right around the time I came here to Generation for the first time. I was new to this whole traveling to preach lifestyle and I was had a busy day of of doing coaching calls and I asked my wife, I said, hey, will you help me book my flight to the Woodlands, Texas? Anybody been to the Woodlands? Okay, this will hit different for y'all then. So I I was gonna go there and ask my wife to book me a flight and these words came out of my mouth. I said, hey, the Woodlands is right outside of Dallas. So book me a flight to Dallas. So if you know anything about Texas geography, you already know where this is going. You're already judging me in your, in your heart. And so about a month later, the day of the trip came, I, I get on the flight, go to the airport. Everything is, feels great. I'm excited. I'm on time. I land in Dallas and I get my phone out as I'm headed to get the rental car to see how far away the hotel is that the church booked. Uh, I thought it would be like 30 minutes away. And so uh, I pull that up and it's not 30 minutes away it was about three and a half hours away. And that's when I realized that the Woodlands is not outside of Dallas. The Woodlands is outside of Houston. So my self-talk over that three and a half hour drive to Houston was not very, was not very healthy. It was not very emotionally mature. It did not show my spiritual formation that I've learned from the book of Mark. But I did get a nice little bonus uh, tour of Texas that I'd never gotten before. So there was a gift in that. But as I was driving, anytime something dumb like that happens, I'm like, okay, God, what are, you, what are you trying to teach me and how can I use this later? And I realized that the whole time I was on that flight, I had no idea I was headed in the wrong direction. Everything felt normal until I got to the place that I never intended to be at. And I think that's what happened here with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, with the religious leaders. Small compromise, after small compromise, after small compromise, eventually led them to a place where they couldn't even recognize the Messiah when he arrived because they were so inward focused. They eventually arrived at a place where their hearts were more concerned about their own power than their own purity. 
and they had a blind spot. And I believe many times we do too. But Jesus, when he comes in and he's turning over the tables, he actually quotes a prophecy from Jeremiah chapter seven. And I love, I don't know if you've noticed this then, Mark, how often Jesus is just pulling from the Old Testament, showing that this has been God's plan all along. But this is what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter seven. And this is foreseeing the very day that we're reading about. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. So as Jesus is pulling from this prophecy, this is what I believe he is, he is saying to the people of Israel and to the religious leaders, that they had come to treat the temple like it was their good luck charm. That because they had the temple, because they had God's presence in the middle of Jerusalem, because they were his people, that they could do whatever they wanted. They could treat people however they wanted. And they thought the temple was their crown for being the people of God. They trusted it more than they trusted God. And in that way, something so beautiful, something so holy had become an idol because it was drawing their hearts away from the God it was really meant to worship. And we can look at the people of Israel and wonder how in the world that happened. How did the shadow become their source? You know, how did they see the temple more about how it served them than how it was meant to serve God? How was it about more about giving them glory rather than giving God glory? How did it become a place, a den of robbers instead of a place of generosity? And like I said, we can point fingers at them without realizing that we do this all the time. My heart does this all the time. And that's why I wanna make a prophetic application from this passage for all of us. We often take something that was meant to be an offering of worship and we turn it into what we worship. So we take a gift that was meant for the purpose of ministry and it becomes an idol that poisons the ministry. Or we take a very good dream that God can use to bless other people and to bless the world and point people to him and we end up clinging to that dream more than we cling to Christ. Or we we have a gift or a talent or something that we love and we attach God's name to it because we're doing it for God, but really we're doing it for ourselves because we like the glory that it brings us. And so we spend our lives when we do this, spend our lives settling for and serving a shadow. And this is how that has played out in my life. So Pastor Brandon mentioned that I was a worship leader and a worship pastor. And I served for about 15 years at a church called Elevation Church in Charlotte. And it was an amazing, amazing place to serve. And our family still attends there. Um, My life was changed there. All three of my daughters gave their life to Christ there. It was an amazing experience. And for the first seven years, I was getting to live my dream as being a worship pastor and worship leader. And then I was able to write songs and we were able to start recording some of those songs and going on tour and all the stuff that I was doing for God and seemed like it was all my dreams coming true. And little by little by little, the thing I was doing for God had started to become my God. And I remember there was this time where my pastor set me down after a worship experience meeting on a Tuesday, and he was trying to give me a vision for my future. And he said, you know, these two other worship leaders, they're amazingly gifted at singing and songwriting. He said, they're great at that. He said, you're good at those things, but I think you have a lid. So that's not fun to hear. Uh, he said, I do think though you have the gift to be a great pastor and shepherd and leader and teacher. And one day you're gonna have to decide, are you willing to let go of what you're good at to take hold of what God's called you to be great at? And even though that stung, even though I didn't wanna hear it, the more I wrestled with that and prayed through that, I realized that that was from God. It wasn't from a man, it was from God for me. And so, you know, my pastor said, this isn't for right now, but I want you to like really start to think about this and pray through this. 
And even though I accepted it up here for years, I just kept thinking, well, no, that, that time is for, for further down the road. I'm not ready to give that up yet because my identity had been wrapped up in, in what I did, not whose I was. And even though I taught people the right thing, I wasn't really believing the right thing in my heart until years later, we were about to record this album and things would always get a little tense around album time because worship leaders, we had more worship leaders and not enough songs for everybody to sing something. And I remember I was praying one day and I said, God, when are they gonna realize that it's not about singing songs on an album, it's about building your church. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, well, you haven't gotten it yet, so how can they get it? And that was the turning point moment for me when I realized, okay, this, this is out of alignment and I've got to surrender this to God. I was holding so tight to the gift that God had given me for a season that I lost sight of trusting the source of that gift. And so I just want to encourage you, God has given you a gift to use for his glory. Don't hide the gift. Don't hear what I'm saying and shrink back from the gift. Use the gift, but your gift is meant to be an offering for God, not a crown for yourself. So be open-handed with the gift. That's what the book that Pastor Brandon talked about that I wrote is all about. It was the journey of me learning how to surrender that. And the temple had become a crown for the people and it was no longer an offering to God. And because of that, Jesus was coming in to the city to judge what the temple had become and also to say that its time was at an end. And that's why Mark communicates a seemingly really random detail about a fig tree in the passage. Did you notice that when we read it? You're like, why in the world did Mark talk about a fig tree? Well, it's a picture to communicate something much bigger. It helps put into context what Jesus was doing. So I wanna go back and just read those verses about the fig tree. So this is Mark 11, uh, verse 12. It says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. And skip down to verse 20. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Now, in fairness to the fig tree, I think it kind of gets a bad rap. It even says here, it wasn't time for fruit. So Jesus isn't giving us like a horticultural lesson or anything like that. He's making a point using this picture. And the point is this, the fig tree is a picture of God's judgment on what the temple had come to represent because it had leaves, but no fruit. It was the most beautiful building in the world, but had no substance. It had the appearance of human glory without the reality of God's glory in it. So its roots had dried up. And so let me just stop and say this. This is a good principle for life. Don't just settle for leaves. Don't be impressed by the leaves. Look for the fruit. Look for the fruit. That's why I love this church. This is a church of deep fruit. This is a place where you can get your roots planted and God can move through you in such a powerful way. And so Jesus was saying the temple, it's, it's all leaves, it's no fruit. And because of that, it's cursed and its time has come to an end. And the temple would actually be destroyed physically about 40 years later in 70 AD, but its purpose and reason for existing was going to end that week. So I know everything so far in this message has been a little heavy. It's been a little bit of a downer, but here's the good news of this message that I've really come to announce and that Jesus came to announce in Jerusalem. And in fact, John in his gospel, when he's telling the same version, his perspective of this story, this is what he said in John 2 verse 19. John 2 19 says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now, on one level, Jesus is talking about his resurrection, but that's only part of it. That's not the full picture of what he's announcing because the resurrection is just the beginning. What he was going to build was more beautiful than any temple, more beautiful than any sanctuary, than any cathedral, because the new temple that he was there to establish and to build and to announce looks just like you. It's the church. And that's my final point today. Jesus is the cornerstone on which a new temple is being built, the church. And this is the reality that Jesus came to bring about. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 10, Jesus actually quotes Psalm 118 when he says, 
The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone of the new temple. That means he is the foundation and the temple that is being built on that foundation has lasted for 2000 years, all the way from Jerusalem now to Portland, Tennessee. It is a, it is a temple that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. It's a temple that's being built by everyone who calls on the name of the Lord in Jesus Christ and is saved. And so Peter is seeing all this happen. He, he was with Jesus as he enters Jerusalem. He saw Jesus crucified. He saw Jesus resurrected. He experienced the Holy Spirit come at Pentecost. And Peter's the one who told Mark his account of Jesus's life. So when you read Mark, you're hearing Peter's story. And so Peter summarizes all of what this means in his letter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And this brings the whole message together. It says, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You in Christ are a living stone being built into a spiritual house. And that partly is what God is doing in you, but it's also what God is doing through you as the church. So the question is, what is that supposed to look like? What, what are the qualities of a temple? And are those actually a reality in our life? So the church should be a house of holiness. It should be a house of worship a house of forgiveness, a house of prayer. It's meant to take the presence of God into every sphere of influence and stronghold of our culture today. And once again, that's what I love about this church. All of those qualities mark Generation Church. So this is good ground to plant and good ground to see fruit grow in your life. But what Jesus came to build wasn't just about a gathering of people. It was about the presence of God that we are meant to carry into our workplace, into our schools, into our family. People don't have to make a pilgrimage to experience the presence of God anymore. We take the presence of God into our world. And that is the good news of the gospel. And 1 Corinthians six nineteen says this. I know I've given you a lot of scripture, but hang with me right here because this is amazing news. Uh, Paul says, do you know that your, temp- that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. This verse is usually talked about in terms of sexual purity, which that is part of it, but it's so much bigger than that. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And while that's good news, because in the Old Testament, the glory of God was a visitation. It fell on certain people in certain places at specific times. But now in the New Testament, the glory of God is a habitation. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here's my simple question for us to consider here at the end of the message. Are you living like you have the spirit of the living God dwelling within you? Does that mark your life? When people see you, do they see leaves or do they see fruit? Do they see the shadow or do they experience the beauty of the Savior? So there's been a lot of times in my life where I looked like I had it all together. I was doing all the right stuff, but I was not abiding in Jesus and I wasn't walking in the power of the Spirit. I had maintained an image, but I lacked intimacy. And I wonder if you've ever been in that same place. In 2020, I know that's a year that none of us want to pretend existed or (laughs) Um, or we want to pretend it didn't exist. But I remember that was a really tough year for me. Um, Ministry was crazy, trying to figure out how to do church. And I'd been doing ministry for a long time. And I realized I was going to my Bible more to do a checklist, quiet time, or to find something to teach. And I wasn't really letting the Holy Spirit speak to me and convict me and inform me. And then our youngest daughter, Sydney, has cystic fibrosis. So we were really concerned for her and didn't know what everything in that year meant for her. And I was sitting on my back porch and it was the the week of the twins' birthday. And they weren't riding a a Jeep this time, but they were just in the backyard. And I remember just having this conversation with the Lord internally while there was a big smile on my face. The inside didn't feel that happy because I was like, God, I feel... Like I've told people that there's abundant life in you. I've told people that they can have joy, they can have peace, they can have all of these things. And I don't feel any of it right now. And I felt like what the Lord spoke to me in a very firm, but 
loving way was, well, you're not creating the space within your heart through your disciplines and your rhythms for me to do the healing work that I wanna do in you. It's like, you're not creating space for the fruit. You're not creating space to abide. And that was a turning point in my life to learn what it really meant to abide in Christ. And so what I really want you to get today is that is what living in the shadow looks like for us now when we prioritize image over intimacy. When you go days without talking to God in prayer and you take for granted the 24 seven access to Jesus that you have, you are settling for a shadow. It's much less than what God wants for you. When you focus on performance over the posture of your heart, you are settling for a shadow. When you try to earn God's love and think you have to measure up to be used by Him, you're settling for a shadow. You're not receiving the gift of grace. When you isolate and withdraw from community, that's a shadow. When you focus only on the people that look like you and act like you, and you don't extend the welcome of the gospel to others that make you uncomfortable, that is settling for a shadow. When you smile at your neighbor, but deep down you hold bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, that is a shadow. And when you come to an amazing church like this and you just come in and out and you don't get involved, you're settling for far less than what God has for you. And my encouragement for you today is don't settle for that. Abide in Jesus, stay connected to the source of life and light in Christ. Love one another, let go of unforgiveness and bitterness. Get involved here at this amazing church and let your roots grow deep. Jesus didn't end the sacrificial system so that we could just live well manicured, safe and self-centered lives. He didn't do it for us to go about our days without relying on the leading and guiding and power of the Holy Spirit. No, he entered Jerusalem that week so that he could lay down his life and rise again so that he could build something better and build something truly beautiful in you. That is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is so much better than anything this world has to offer. He is the cornerstone. So build your life, your dreams, your ambitions, your family, your career, your finances, your time. Build it all on that cornerstone because I promise you, Jesus is better. Don't settle for anything less than what He offers. Thanks for joining us today. I really pray that this message blessed you. If it did, then please like the video if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, leave a review, comment, all those things. It really, really does help us out. And it helps me see what's resonating with you and how God is moving in your life. And if it's something that you think could encourage someone else, then please share this episode. You have no idea how God can work through a simple act just like that. Once again, thank you for joining us. And if this message did speak to you and resonate with you, then I encourage you to pick up the book, This Dream Is Not For You, because I think that it will be a tremendous encouragement for you as well. I'll see you back here next week for more Dreamers and Disciples. Mm -hmm.